Okay, when we uh, left off last time, we were about to um, talk about double and triple covalent bonds. Uh, double and triple covalent bonds occur because sometimes sharing one pair of electrons is not enough for atoms to reach an octet of valence electrons around them. And in those cases, the solution, in many cases anyway, is to form a second or third bond in the same location. And so if you form a second bond in, this, in the same location as the first, that would be known as a double bond. And it consists of sharing two pairs of electrons or four electrons total between two atoms. And if that's still not enough to reach an octet, sometimes you share a third pair of electrons between those two atoms. And that would be known as a triple bond. <clears throat> Some simple examples of where double and triple bonds form can be found among some of the diatomic elements. So for example, oxygen, O2. You have an oxygen atom that has six valence electrons and another oxygen atom that also has six valence electrons. And if you bring them together to form a single bond, that would be basically where one of these odd electrons on one atom um, teams up with the, the uh, odd electron on the other atom and they share them, you would have something that looked like this. Okay, you can look through the, um, uh, count, basically count up the electrons on each of the two atoms and see if they have octets. The oxygen on the left would have these electrons that could count as belonging to it. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's not an octet. For the right hand oxygen also, you can do this and that comes out to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are not octets. <clears throat> well, what can you do? Well, you might notice that uh, the way we drew the electrons around the um, oxygens, you've got another odd electron on each oxygen and they could combine to form a bond also, in which case you have something that looks like this, that's four electrons shared between the two oxygen atoms. That would be a double bond. And also these lone pairs uh, bonds or lone pair electrons remaining. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind when, um, uh, basically drawing a Lewis structure and then uh, say going from a single bond to a double bond or a double bond to a triple bond. When you move these lone pair electrons to a position between the atoms so that they can be shared and become a bond, you have to remember that they're no longer where they used to be. So I had to remember not to draw these lone pair electrons under the oxygens where they were before because they're now up here between the oxygens. <clears throat> so now if you count the uh, electrons on the oxygen on the left, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's an octet. If you do it with the oxygen on the right, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's also an octet. So this is what the oxygen atom would actually look like as a Lewis structure. Or you could also draw it in um, using lines for the bonds, you know, in the way that um, emphasizes how many bonds there are. And a double bond would look kind of like an equal sign, you know, two lines, uh, one on top of the other, two horizontal lines. And so there, there you are. An example of a triple bond can be found in nitrogen. If you have a nitrogen atom with its five valence electrons around it, one, two, three, four, five, and another nitrogen atom with five valence electrons around it, you can try to bring them together to form a single bond and you would get something like this. <clears throat> and when we go to count the electrons around each nitrogen, we'll find that the one on the left has one, two, three, four, five, six 
and the one on the right has one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, that was even worse than the oxygen. So if you go one more step and try to um, uh, get a double bond, say take this uh, lone pair electron and this lone pair electron and put them together to form another bond, we get something like this. And the nitrogen on the left now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. Still not an octet, but it's better. And the nitrogen on the right also has seven electrons. So we're getting there. Do the same thing again. Take uh, one more electron from each nitrogen and put it between the nitrogen atoms. And you end up with this. The nitrogens are sharing three pairs of electrons. That is a triple bond. When you total up the electrons on the left-hand nitrogen, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, now we've got an octet. For the right-hand nitrogen, it's the same deal, only backwards. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's an octet. So that would be your Lewis structure for nitrogen. Or you could draw it to emphasize the bonds. And uh, triple bond is just three horizontal lines. And so that's another way of drawing nitrogen. <clears throat> All right, so that's why double and triple bonds form. We also have um, models versus reality for covalent bonds. Uh, you might want to know whether our modeling of covalent bonds is really valid. And one way that you can find that out is by comparing predictions of the model of, uh, for covalent bond, uh, bonding versus what covalently bonded compounds are really like. Okay, so for covalent bonding, um, the Lewis structure does combine why, you know, it basically, uh, um, it basically predicts the combinations of atoms that will uh, combine with each other accurately um, just through basically putting the atoms together so that they uh, will have octets around them. <clears throat> and so And so the Lewis theory, like I said, pred uh, successfully predicts the combinations of elements. And one of them would be, for instance, the compound between hydrogen and oxygen is H2O, not H3O. But the fact is that if you take away an electron, you can form H3O, but it'll have a positive charge. But you can't do it according to the Lewis structures uh, you can't uh, form an H3O molecule that will be stable with no charge on it. Okay. <clears throat> also, uh, the theory predicts the covalent bonds will be directional. You know, not like um, not like uh, ionic bonds, where the um, uh, attraction between positive and negative ions radiates outward in three directions. So a positive ion can be attracted to a negative ion, not just next to it, but you know on the other side of it, or in front of it, or behind it, or above or below it. Um, on the other hand, covalent bonds <clears throat> only involve 
two specific electrons. Or two, uh, sorry, two specific atoms. And that's because the covalent bonds involve the sharing of a pair of electrons, specifically in the space between the two atoms. Okay, so the, the attraction does not radiate outward in all directions like it does for ionic bonds. And because that attraction doesn't radiate out in all directions, covalent compounds consist of um, separate independent molecules. As opposed to the three dimensional array of positive and negative ions, like you get in ionic compounds. And for covalent compounds, intermolecular forces and these are uh, what we mean by inter, inter means between or among. So when we talk about intermolecular forces, we're talking about attractions between molecules. Are much weaker for covalent compounds than intramolecular forces are. And by intramolecular forces, what we mean is forces within a molecule. That's what intra means, is within. <clears throat> um, and of course, the forces within a molecule would be covalent bonds. So any forces of attraction between molecules would be much weaker than the forces of attraction between the atoms in a molecule. And that's another reason why uh, covalent compounds exist as separate, um, distinct, uh, independent molecules is because if you have a unit of H2O, the hydrogens and the oxygen within that molecule are very strongly attracted to one another, and that's known as a covalent bond, but one H2O molecule is not very strongly attracted to other H2O molecules. So that would be the force between the molecules. In ionic compounds, intra and intermolecular forces are actually the same thing. Because remember, in ionic compounds, we don't distinguish one molecule from another. It's just three-dimensional arrays of alternating positive and negative ions and we give the lowest whole number ratio of the positive to negative ion as the formula for the compound. But the actual ions uh, will go on and on and on in every direction until you've got billions and billions of trillions of them, even in a small like grain of salt. <clears throat> okay, the melting, so the um, melting a covalent solid should require overcoming relatively weak intermolecular attractions. Uh, 
Okay, so um, what melting is essentially is uh, turning a uh, solid into a liquid by adding heat to it. So, you know, like melting ice. When ice warms up, it turns to liquid water. <clears throat> what happens at the molecular level is that in the solid, the molecules are strongly attracted to each other, strongly enough that the molecules are fixed in place. So, you know, with ice, it's made up of H2O molecules, just like liquid water is. But when you lower the temperature of H2O molecules enough, they slow down and sort of get close enough to each other that they develop a significant attraction for each other. And that attraction is strong enough to keep the H2O molecules sort of frozen, if you will, in place. <clears throat> and they don't move around and past one another. If you warm that ice up, you are adding energy to those H2O molecules. And not only do they vibrate faster in place, but sometimes they vibrate violently enough that they can break free of the intermolecular attractions for neighboring H2O molecules, and they can start to move around and past one another. And that is what we know as flow. They start to flow. And flowing is one of the characteristics of a liquid. Once it gets to the point where they're all like that, the ice has completely melted into liquid water. So what we're looking at here in this last entry is how much energy would it take to break those H2O molecules free of their intermolecular attractions just enough so that they can move around and past one another and become a liquid, in other words. Well, if those, we've already established up above that those intermolecular attractions between the H2O molecules are relatively weak. And so it requires, it should require relatively little energy to overcome those weak intermolecular forces. And this is what we're kind of leading up to here. That's true. <clears throat> uh, covalently bonded solids have low melting points. So this is just by way of sort of checking out the theory. Yeah, the theory works out um, because it says essentially that um, covalently bonded solids should have low melting points, and they do. And that's one of many areas in which the model and the theory agree. OK, so uh, the next section is about electronegativity and bond polarity. And um, what this comes down to, we haven't, uh, well, I've mentioned electronegativity before, and I've said briefly what it is. It has to do with how strongly an atom attracts electrons. And um, because different elements have different levels of attraction for electrons, that means that when two different elements form a bond, sometimes the electrons within that bond will not be distributed evenly between the two atoms. So that's what we're getting at here. And when that happens, that's what's known as a polar bond, by the way. And so the sharing of electrons between atoms in a covalent bond is not always equal. One good example is HCl. Uh, so we're talking about the intact molecule here. So this would be uh, hydrogen chloride as a gas. <clears throat> the electrons are not equally shared. There's the Lewis structure for HCl. Or if you want to emphasize the bond, you could draw it that way. 
And like I said, these um, electrons are not equally shared. As it turns out, chlorine actually draws the electrons closer to itself. And that makes the Cl and the chlorine end of the molecule a partial negative charge. And this is just the Greek letter, the lowercase Greek letter delta with a negative sign after it. And that means partial negative charge. Hydrogen has its electrons pulled away. By the chlorine, but not taken away completely. And so what that means is that um, the, the hydrogen end of the molecule has a partial positive charge to it. And this is what we call a polar covalent bond. One end is slightly negative, one end is slightly positive. <clears throat> the ideal covalent bond is nonpolar because, well, when you think about what the word covalent means, again, it means sharing covalent shell or sharing valence shells. Uh, and so if it's an equal sharing, that could also be called a nonpolar covalent uh, bond. But uh, you can also just think of it as a perfect uh, ideal covalent bond. So for example, chlorine, Cl2, and we have this as uh, being our Lewis structure, and this is an equal sharing of electrons. There's no partial positive or negative charge on either end of the, of the bond. And this would be a nonpolar covalent bond. Or just covalent bond. Uh, technically, if you say covalent bond, uh, technically it means nonpolar unless you say polar. So you can see what. Um, Whatever electron or uh, attraction for electrons chlorine has, well, the other chlorine has the same attraction. So it's not going to pull the electrons to one end or the other. The, and in the uh, HCl molecule though, turns out chlorine has more of an attraction for electrons than hydrogen does. And we represent that by drawing an arrow with a positive sign at the opposite end from the head. The head of the arrow indicates which way the electrons are going. And the positive end of the arrow represents, well, the end of the um, bond that the electrons are being pulled away from. And so you could represent that like this. Sometimes it's the uh, arrow is drawn right on top of the bond, which can be drawn like this if you're lacking an artistic skill to the extent I am, <clears throat> something like that. And that brings us to electronegativity. And that's because electronegativity is the attraction for uh, electrons within a bond. Okay, so for attraction for of uh, an atom for electrons within a bond, you 
You can also think of the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms in a bond as being um, reflective of how much ionic character the bond has. The bigger the difference in electronegativity is, the more ionic the bond is. Above a certain level, the bond is considered ionic. Uh, you know, above a certain level for the difference in electronegativities between the two atoms involved in a bond. If it's greater than a certain number, then um, the bond is considered ionic. But there are different degrees to which you can be ionic. <clears throat> so some, uh, and there are different degrees to which you can be covalent. There's uh, complete or uh, ideal or nonpolar covalent bonds, bonds that are totally covalent and where the electrons are shared equally, like we just saw with chlorine. And then there are bonds where the electrons are shared very unevenly, but they're still covalent, like HCl. And then there are bonds where the electron actually goes from one element to another, and that is a, you know, a total ionic bond, like NaCl. There is a trend in the periodic table. And is, that is that electronegativity increases going up a group and it increases from left to right. Major exception would be the noble gases. They have very low electronegativities, even though they're way over on the right. Um, and that's because they're odd. They don't want to gain or lose electrons. The most electronegative element in the entire periodic table is fluorine, which is in the upper right-hand corner, uh, ignoring the noble gases. And the two least electronegative elements, they're tied for last place, would be cesium and fluorine, or uh, sorry, cesium and francium, which are down in the lower left-hand corner of the periodic table. They have very, very low electronegativity values. Uh, the actual electronegativity values for the various elements are listed on page 373 in the textbook, and they all have uh, certain numbers associated with them. Essentially, the higher the number, the um, greater the attraction that element has for electrons within a bond. Fluorine is the greatest. Uh, its electronegativity number, I believe, is 4.0, and cesium and francium are the lowest, and theirs are if I recall correctly, 0 0.7. So there's a fair range in electronegativity values. Uh, bond polarity, let's see. Okay, so bond polarity is um, based on the electronegativity difference. And the electronegativity difference, you can call that delta En. Uh, and for that, you can just take the electronegativity for one element involved in a bond and subtract the electronegativity value for the other element in the bond. And the electronegativity difference ultimately gives you, it tells you about the degree of polarity within the bond or whether it's ionic. So if the difference in electronegativity is anywhere from zero up to about 0 0.4, the bond is considered to be a nonpolar covalent. <clears throat> uh, 
obviously, if there's some difference in the electronegativity, then the sharing is not really truly totally equal between the two atoms. But it's close enough that for all practical purposes, the bond would be nonpolar. So this would be, this would take in any case where the two uh, atoms in the bond are of the same element, like the diatomic elements, or say a carbon-carbon bond in um, a large organic molecule. <clears throat> but it also takes in uh, cases where there are different elements, but they have only slightly different electronegativities, like carbon-hydrogen bonds, for instance. And you find carbon-hydrogen bonds in a lot of organic compounds. And that is considered to be, for all practical purposes, a nonpolar bond. If the uh, difference in electronegativity is anywhere from about 0.5 up to 2.0, then this would be considered polar covalent bond. And this would be things like um, the bonds in H2O um, or the bonds in um, uh, HCl. Those would be polar covalent bonds. And that's an unequal sharing of electrons. And if the difference in electronegativity is greater than or equal to about 2.0, then that means that the electron is completely transferred from one element to another, and that would be an ionic bond. So these are the general uh, ranges for different types of bonds. And again, you can find those just by taking the electronegativity value for uh, just, and remember when you're finding the, the difference in electronegativity, you're focusing on one bond at a time. So there will only be two atoms involved in that bond and, because bonds are always between two atoms. And you just take the electronegativity value of one of them minus the electronegativity value of the other. Electronegativity differences are always positive. So it's always the bigger number minus the smallest number, smaller number. And then you just compare it to the list and see, okay, this is what type of bond it is. Okay, I'm gonna stop with the, um, uh, first segment now, especially since they're coming to get me. So um, I might have to run. <laughs> so uh, anyway, if I'm still here, we'll be back with part B in just a moment.